So good evening, everyone. Welcome to this Veterans Day event, Finding True North Through Writing, a reading by the Syracuse Veterans Writing Group. My name is Eileen Schell, and I'm a professor of writing at Syracuse University and the founder and co-leader of the Syracuse Veterans Writing Group. On behalf of the group and my co-leaders, Ivy Kleinbart and Dr. Diane Grimes, I'd like to welcome you to this reading. Tonight's event is sponsored by Hendricks Chapel and the Moral Injury Project at Syracuse University, the Department of Writing Studies, Rhetoric and Composition, and Lemoyne College. I'd like to thank our tech coordinator, Alex Snow, and the team at Hendricks Chapel, Peg Northrup, Delaney Vanaway, and Dean Brian Conkle, for helping us organize and fund this event. Thanks also to Daryl Lavelle for her steadfast help with media relations. And thanks to CART Services for making this an accessible event. The final major thanks goes to the Veterans Writing Group itself and to the veterans on the Zoom stage tonight. Pete McShane, Dr. Bill Cross, Jennifer Jeffrey, Robert Brewer, Paul Matura, Lee Savage, Robert Markison, and we hope Rick Richard Rodriguez. The Syracuse Veterans Writing Group is a group of military veterans who write nonfiction accounts or true stories of life in and out of the military. Veterans of all ages, branches of service, and conflicts attend our monthly writing group meetings. At our meeting, we write and share stories about military service and warfare in a supportive and encouraging atmosphere meant to center the truths of each individual veteran's experiences. We've been at this work now for a decade. Some of our group members have published books, won national awards, and been in public readings locally, regionally, and nationally. Our group has published a book entitled The Weight of My Armor, which Parlor Press published in 2017. You can find it on Amazon. Tonight, you will hear from a group of veterans representing four branches of the military, all weighing in on the theme of military service and its impact on their lives and especially as they went through transitions in that cycle of service. Transitions are a commonplace in the military, whether it's going through in-processing, training, deploying, fighting in wars, recuperating from wounds, or separating from the military, coming home, navigating the VA system, reestablishing relationships with family members and loved ones, going to college on the GI Bill, processing traumas and memories, and many more experiences. Some of our members will also address the moral dilemmas and challenges that war poses not only at the time of service, but many years after. So tonight, to celebrate veterans, let's honor them by listening deeply to their stories. Not the stories of Hollywood movies or of the retired generals serving as consultants on CNN, but listening to veteran stories as they make their way home long after develop deployments have ended. After the reading, there will be an opportunity to answer questions via the chat function, which will be monitored by my colleagues, Ivy Kleinbart and Diane Grimes. Our first reader tonight is Pete McShane. He served as a US Army Special Forces medic during the Vietnam conflict. He's a graduate of Syracuse University with an MBA and he had a career in banking and finance. Much of it is a consultant to small businesses. He's the author of the memoir, Save a Life, Take a Life. Pete McShane will be reading a piece entitled Back on Campus. Pete. Thank you, Eileen. There was never a question about what I would do for a living after leaving the service. I had served as a special forces medic in Vietnam and wanted to become a doctor. A college dropout before being drafted, I was accepted at Syracuse University as a second semester sophomore, beginning in the spring of 1970. War wounds had earned me a 40% disability rating from the Veterans Administration which qualified me for the vocational rehabilitation program, a full ride, where my tuition and books would be paid for by the government, and I would receive a monthly subsistence payment to cover food, clothing, and other necessities. I settled into college life with determination, but it was difficult 
for me. I was floating on a sea of hope like thousands of other students truly on my own. And it took months to get into the academic groove. At 24 and married, I was the adult in a world of children. I was there to get a degree, not to protest, party, or skip class. It was business for me, something you did because you had to in order to get into the workforce. The growing unrest over the US presence in Vietnam was evident on the SU campus that spring. Anger no doubt fueled by the disgrace of the My Lai massacre and the Kent State killings. The news media kept the spectacle of an unpopular war alive with graphic reports from the war zone. Students protested the war, held sit-ins and otherwise had little tolerance for any opposing viewpoint. They desecrated the flag and carried effigies of soldiers, vilifying us as baby killers and warmongers. I wasn't spat upon or dissed because I looked and dressed like a student. I'd growed my hair long and moved around campus incognito, but I felt like an amputee caught adrift from the student body. No one knew I had been a soldier as if I'd had a choice. It was either run to Canada or get drafted. Reflecting now, it would have taken more courage to run. I'm sure there were other vets on campus, but they were probably hiding too. The protesters' arguments were logical and made me question our mission in Vietnam. Our government propped up a corrupt regime in South Vietnam under the guise of preventing the spread of communism from North Vietnam. The US violated the Geneva Accords of 1954, which called for the unification of North and South through elections, which were never going to take place. And I took a bullet for that. Confused and shaken, I wanted desperately to believe that my presence in Vietnam helped people and that I did some good. Agreeing with the protesters would have rendered my sacrifice and those I had served with who died meaningless. I wanted them to know that I had risked my life to rescue a child in the minefield, that I had doctored hundreds of local villagers who had never in their lives had professional medical care, that I never knowingly took another person's life in a firefight. Protesters weren't in a conciliatory mood, and so I believed they didn't want to hear my stories. We were both angry. They needed someone to blame for the collateral damage, the senseless, wanton slaying of innocent people in two countries that wanted to unite, and I hated them for blaming me. Once Nixon authorized the Cambodian invasion on April 30th, college campuses exploded in violence. The Kent State killings by National Guard troops in early May precipitated student riots and picketing at colleges all around the country. A handful of radicals barricaded the SU campus, took over the administration building and held the chancellor hostage, virtually shutting down the campus. The school closed early for the semester. Unfortunately, there were no finals, which would have been an opportunity for me to improve my overall GPA, which needed help. I was off to a bad start on my plan to become a doctor. I never did become a doctor, but that's another story. Syracuse University's campus in 2020 is familiar to me, even with the addition of the dome and several new buildings. I don't feel the same tenseness when I walk the quad now. Veterans today are enthusiastically welcomed into the SU community. Transition services are available and the VA Medical Center is within walking distance. I now feel part of that community because I had the good fortune of finding the Syracuse Veterans Writing Group 10 years ago. Talking to other vets, and writing about experiences like the ones I had on campus in 1970 is the reason. As my experiences in 1970 show, SU has not always been a military friendly campus. Now it embraces veterans with the creation of the Institute for Veterans and Military Families, which is focused on the social, economic, education and policy issues impacting veterans 
and their families post-service. Veterans today have an opportunity to take advantage of unprecedented educational, employment, healthcare, and counseling services not available in 1970. And the bonus is they have the support of the community at large. I only wish that support had been available when my generation returned from Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Our next reader is Dr. Bill Cross. Bill spent 10 years in the Army, including combat duty in Vietnam, after which he was a professor of psychology and leadership at West Point. He's a practicing psychotherapist in Syracuse, who's worked with military veterans and their families for over 35 years. Dr. Cross is an emeritus professor of psychology at Onondaga Community College, and he teaches meditation and stress reduction at the Zen Center of Syracuse. Dr. Cross will be reading the piece entitled Coming Home. Thank you, Eileen. <clears throat> After graduating from West Point and serving two years in the 4th Infantry Division at Fort Lewis, I volunteered to go to Vietnam. Uncle Sam had paid for my college, whose purpose was to train me to be an Army officer, and Vietnam was where we were needed most. I was assigned as a troop advisor to a Vietnamese armored cavalry troop in the Delta. There, our troop provided road security and rapid reaction force. My job was to call in American gunships and airstrikes and advise, serve as a liaison between the Army Republic of Vietnam and American efforts, gather and report intelligence, and encourage my Vietnamese counterparts. In order to do that, the Army had sent me to language school and I had become fluent in Vietnamese before sheep shipping over there. In 10 years in the army, my family and I moved 13 times. Each one required a transition. However, the transitions for Vietnam were probably the most significant. And like all other transitions in my life, they continue to resound. I am still 50 years later in the process of returning from the war. The first memory of that time was riding back on the plane from Saigon to Oakland. I was sitting with John Dilley, with whom I'd ridden to Vietnam in the first place. I remember looking around and thinking who didn't make the return trip section with us. At that time, Bob Fuelhart, Ron Zinn, Frank Reasoner, Jim Ray, and Ed Krukowski hadn't made it. There would be 18 more of my class who didn't make it home from Vietnam. Meeting with my wife at JFK was awesome. We rented a nearby hotel room and spent the night in each other's arms. The next morning, I was so excited to meet my 21 month old daughter. We drove home to Queemans, New York near Albany where my wife and daughter had been living. What a joy it was to see and eventually hold her as I remember Someone presented her and we both assessed his, the stranger looking back at us. My folks and in-laws were respectful and didn't ask many questions. And if they did, they were awkward. I was uncomfortable and moved on to practicalities like what's for supper. I remember my dad was most empathic. At a local bar, he just quietly asked open-endedly how it was for me to come home. And then he listened. I went on to postings at Fort Sill and Fort Knox and joyfully welcomed our second daughter to the family. It was at Fort Knox that we received orders to go back to West Point in the Department of Military Psychology and Leadership by way of Syracuse University, where I'd pursue a master's degree in preparation to teach. In Syracuse, we experienced anti-war fervor firsthand. We had secured a 14 month rental in Mattydale. Yet when I went to sign the lease, the seller's agent told us that we were unwelcome since we were in the military. Then while on campus joining other students for coffee one day, two women who we were also taking a psychology course with got up from the table in a huff when they learned I'd been in Vietnam and 
was en route to West Point to teach. I also was beginning to question our involvement in Vietnam at that time. It was a pivotal time for me. The tour at West Point provided us with the support of classmates and old friends from our other posts. Andy War Forever was picking up. There we experienced the daily news of war's protests and promotions of it. The seemingly weekly funeral ceremonies at the West Point Cemetery. The shouts of New York City protesters carried up the Hudson River. The superintendent at West Point, the former Americal Division commander, was removed from command when news of the My Lai massacre and his unit's participation was revealed. My fellow leadership instructors and I encouraged senior cadets to think about what constituted a lawful versus an unlawful order, exploring what actions to take when they assume command in Vietnam soon after graduation. All the experience up to that point, Vietnam, funerals, counseling soldiers, psychology classes at SU, counseling conflicted cadets, the birth of our third daughter, led me to seek further education as a professional psychotherapist. The Army said they would support that and a subsequent return to West Point after another tour in Vietnam. Attendance at a year-long Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth and additional schooling. All told, that meant four more family moves before settling down. My wife said, and, and we both remember this time, that she didn't know if she'd be there on my return if I chose to go back to Vietnam. I returned, resigned from the Army and returned to SU for my PhD as a civilian. Since I left the military, I've learned more of war's ongoing destruction and transformations in counseling other vets and their families. Their experience deepens mine. Whether sitting with a World War II vet who helped liberate Nazi prison camps and lived with that horror, with a Marine who lived through the bitter winter retreat from Yalu in Korea, a Vietnam vet dying from the effects of Agent Orange, or a Gulf War vet struggling to breathe from the toxic air he breathed there. The bottom line is that war is filled with pain, rage, fear, sadness, and struggle, which can darken our souls. It can also inspire us to transform that darkness into light. As Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese monk and meditation master whom I studied with has said, the victims of war are the flames on the tip of the candle lighting the way to peace. Thich Nhat Hanh gave me the Dharma name firm voice of the heart. And I continue to try to live into that name. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our next reader is Jennifer Jeffrey. She served in the US Coast Guard from 1990 to 1998. She was a machinery technician third class E4 at search and rescue small boat stations in Michigan, Maryland, Virginia, and Florida. Her primary work involves search and rescue and law enforcement. Jennifer is currently an academic librarian at SUNY Potsdam, and she will be reading Going West to Come East. Jen? Thank you, Eileen. Sea level to 6,000 feet. What was I thinking that bright day I walked out of my last duty station in Clearwater, Florida? Separated is what the military calls it. Cut off immediately and absolutely from the life I'd lived in the past seven years. I wasn't sure what would happen when the routine of 24 hours on duty, 24 hours off duty was no longer there calling out the rhythm of my life. Directing a search and rescue case all night then making sure the station was ready for the next crew and getting home with an hour left before my son got out of school had been a common occurrence in my life. I would not be able to see my son every, I would be able to see my son every night now and leave the ranks of the sleep deprived behind. 
he was the reason I was leaving. I had a choice between my Coast Guard career and the emotional son of my life, uh, the emotional life of my son. I had completed all the requirements to make the next rank. If I stayed in the military and made rank, I would be transferred. My next assignment was almost guaranteed to be a ship. Since the only billets available for females at the time were on 378 foot cutters, I would be underway for six weeks at a time. I would lose custody of my son because I knew my ex-husband would not want my son to stay with a babysitter for that long. It wasn't really a choice. So I left and I tried not to look back. I was excited to explore somewhere and something new. My boyfriend and I were headed to Lake Tahoe, California. Fueled by curiosity and childhood consumption of Louis L'Amour books, Westward was my dream. The executive petty officer of station San Key in Clearwater was convinced that I belonged out there. He could not reconcile what he saw as my vibe with his picture of a New Yorker. He would not be swayed no matter how many times I told him that New York City only encompassed 302 square miles of New York State's almost 55,000 square miles. He said, if I ever got out west, I should visit Centennial, Wyoming. That was the town he envisioned me hailing from. So among other places, like the world's largest prairie dog, dog attraction, we visited the town of Centennial. It waits at the base of the Wind River Mountains, and it did look like the Western version of my hometown. At the summit, there was a stone parapet overlook and an emaciated red fox wandering around. I fed him some crackers, wishing I had more. Vigilant for signs of what my future might hold, I wondered if this fox was a sign. And if so, what did it mean? That night, we camped on the other side of the mountains. We burned some of my journal writings in the campfire. My boyfriends are always trying to get me to let go of my past. I went along with it at the time in the spirit of a fresh start. But sometimes I want to know what was on those pages. My journals trace my life. They are a mosaic of poetry, prose, art, angst, and insights. Burning them was a violation to my spirit. I am kinder to myself now when transitioning from one part of life to another. I would not burn things if I was in the shadow of the mountain tonight. There are deep gifts and transitions if you pay attention. Often I'm in the middle of a shift before I'm aware. A transition meaningful to my growth as a writer was sparked by Minnie Bruce Pratt, a poet that I admire. Six years after I separated from the Coast Guard and had drifted back east, I went to the talk she gave regarding the narrative, narrative of liberating women and children and how it is often used as an argument to justify going to war. She called out the narrative as false, since in war, women and children are always subject to more suffering. It made me pay attention to narratives and artic it made me pay attention to the stories we tell and accept as truth. Her lecture also made me want to be able to critique narratives and articulate my experiences through my writing. 11 years after I separated from the Coast Guard, I took a summer class in creative nonfiction taught by Minnie Bruce. I thought I would write about nature or trips that I had been on. But throughout the course, I kept coming back to an incident that haunted me from my last years in the service. I wrote some powerful pieces for that class and left armed with an awakening and Minnie Bruce's encouragement to push my writing further. 12 years after I separated from the Coast Guard, the Syracuse Veterans Writing Group was formed. 15 years after I separated from the Coast Guard, I attended my first Veterans Writing Group meeting. Belonging to this group has given me a place to share and test my narratives and interact with others who seek their own truths and how to convey them effectively. I'm still working on writing the story of the incident that weighs on my mind from so many years ago, as I know there is something important there. Writing is the constant through the transitions of my life. I won't go on about all that the practice of writing has meant to me, 
except to say that it has saved my life many times over. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jen. Our next reader is Paul Matura. He served in the US Army for over 30 years. He's the author of three books. You can find him on Amazon. The Best Worst Tank in the Ship That Wasn't, a collection of unique military stories. Berlin, Baghdad, Benning and Bragg, Memories of a Long Military Career, and Wounded Knee and the Bridge Too Far. Paul? Paul, you have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, um, although I served 35 years in the Army, I'd like to say that I served in four different armies. A military personnel operate in a transitional environment, and so does the military. The military is grand and, as such, more important than the people who comprise it. Successful transition for a military force is arguably the most important factor for the continued existence of a country. History is full of countries or societies that didn't transition forward militarily and do not exist anymore. The large military transitions without empathy for those who serve in it. It has been said that the military has no feelings. After a long and successful career, the Army sent me a letter indicating that I was no longer needed and I was not going to be part of its transition forward. Not all transition is good for the force. Some bring it backwards in effectiveness and ultimately make it worse. Recent examples are the reliance of GPS technology for navigation, which has created a force that struggles with map reading. Not running in boots during physical training has unexpectedly contributed to soldiers having a difficult time running in boots. As I look back on my career, I'm surprised at how extensive the transition has been. I served in Germany at the edge of the Iron Curtain, but later served with personnel from several Warsaw Pact countries. I served with some of them in bases in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, which was then located in the former Soviet Union. Drinking alcohol was on duty was common and accepted, but in recent times, a DUI would destroy a military career. As a young soldier operating weapons display at West Point, I watched female cadet gymnasts smoke cigarettes before and after events. Decades later, I was an instructor at West Point, and smoking wasn't even allowed on the academy at all. Uh, soldiers have less unhealthy habits now, such as smoking, but they have transitioned to more opioid use. I was questioned about my knowledge of the sexual preference of soldiers and knew some who were discharged because of such. I was assigned as a preliminary investigator of a case during the don't ask, don't tell policy, but then I later served as deputy chief of staff for an openly gay deputy commanding general. Females were limited to support roles in the non-combat arms branches, but they currently serve in all branches of the Army. A high percent of the training was hands-on, but a lot of it's computer-based now. I entered a large force, which became a smaller force after the post-Cold War 1990s drawdown. It grew again during the war on terror, but then has been reduced again. Equipment is much better now, but soldiers are less mechanically inclined. I once watched as several soldiers attempted to replace a flat tire. They couldn't do it because they grew up at a time when none of them had to change a tire. A lot of people enlisted in the military after graduating from college. There was a lot less of that in the 1980s. I remember some soldiers were given a choice of jail or the army. They don't do that anymore. I saw a soldier's bad conduct discharge read aloud as he stood in front of a formation. They don't do that anymore. I used to stand in line and report to the pay officer to be paid in cash. They don't do that anymore. The Army actually canceled bayonet training on some of its installations. It was determined that alternate training was more useful. Soldiers often deploy and operate in an environment that they are not trained in. An example of this is a tank crew deploying to Afghanistan where tanks are not useful or needed. There are a lot of required online trainings now on subjects such as human trafficking, cyber awareness, environmental protection, LGBT rights, and IEDs. Soldiers spend less time doing what they're trained to do because of these trainings. Soldiers do not shine boots or iron uniforms anymore, so they will presumably have th the thousands of hours that I spent shining boots and ironing uniforms. 
So the military trans transitions forward and backwards, positively and negatively. Hopefully it's transitioning in the right direction because our existence might someday depend on it. And that's all I have, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Our next reader is Robert Brewer. He was an Albanian language translator for US Naval Security Group. His poem, Tracking Colonel Qaddafi, appears in the current edition of Proud to Be, Writing of American Warriors, which I think released today. And he has a nonfiction piece forthcoming in war, literature, and the arts. The title of Robert's piece is Lost in Translation. I was slated to be on leave in 12 hours physically at my desk, but mentally halfway to France with tickets in my pocket for the annual jazz festival in the city of Nice, the French Riviera. Bill Evans will be playing piano. Miles Davis had said, listening to Bill Evans is like listening to a waterfall cascading. Eddie Cleanhead Vincent would be banging out the bop and Dizzy Gillespie was on the card. Dizzy's recent recordings had an Afro-Cuban sound. He'd put a little rock in your sock, a little shake in your bake, some boogaloo through and through. I imagined a red and white checkerboard tablecloth for a picnic on the ground, baguettes, ham and Swiss, French rosé. The only glitch in this feast was a US Marine Corps gunnery sergeant walking right at me in the 302 Airborne Division Office. Hark, I said, the Marines have landed. How goes it in the world of international espionage? Fair to horse shit, the gunny groused. I got a language tape here, but it's more garbled than snot in a handkerchief. Can you give this a listen for me? A red Marine Corps turtleneck rose up from his flight suit. His boots pounded the metal gangway as we strode through the hall to the bank of recorders in the audio space. Hey, I got a tape, man. Can you give it a listen? Piano chords were suddenly dissonant. Dizzy bored through syncopated notes I didn't recognize. I blinked hard, matching his image to his voice. He'd made it back to us in Spain after a flight over the Adriatic. The Albanians could have vectored aircraft out to inspect him or worse, shoot him down. Sure, I said. He outranked me four pay grades. And these were the Marines. They protected Navy personnel. Nobody bothered the linguists when the Marines were around. As a professional courtesy, I had to return the favor and listen to a tape he had risked his life to get. We both worked the Albanian language vineyard, plucking words from the air, relaying them to London for distribution to ships at sea. The gunny was a sea dog who was still curious. He liked learning new tricks. You know the expression hop jar, so you can tell fleet commanders they've opened fire. But think about this, I said. With one more word, you can give the fleet a lot more warning. After all, when they're shooting at you, it's too late. So say this, prig a teat to hop jar. Prepare to open fire. Can I say pregatit? No, Gunny, that's not the word. The word is pregatit. But I like saying pregatit. I know you like it, but that's not the word. You know what your problem is, sailor? You're too strapped for this Navy. No sense of humor. Yeah, well, if you're shot down in flames, that won't be so funny, now will it? All right, all right. Pregatita Habshar. Duck, honey, get down. You just said they're getting ready to shoot us. Fuckers got a sense of humor. All right, let's listen to this shit. See what we can get from this goddamn dictatorship. Jeez, you're right, Gunny. This is a garbled transmission. It's the A3 flight recorders. I'm going to recommend we start taking the P3 up there. A fly takes off. You'll hear it on P3. Garbled tape or not, there was still hope. I could cancel my leave, drive through the town, past the Missouri bar, 
the Europa Bar, the showgirls from England, get my dictionaries, return to base, sink into transcendental stupor, commune with the ancient heroes, climb the mountain crags and steal the words from eagles the way Prometheus stole fire. Working into the wee hours, the sun would break over the Atlantic. The fully formed translation would walk up to me, tug at my dungarees and say, I'm what you've been looking for. Vesson fresh. The vendor worked the crowd, hawking cold refreshments on the cold sand. I stabbed the Riviera shore with a beach umbrella, sunk into a beach chair, popped a cork on cold burgundy, unfolded the International Herald Tribune, and promptly gagged, choking on the cold wine. China cuts ties with Albania, the headline read. Chinese technicians leave the country, blueprints in hand. Small East European country flounders. The gunny's tape. So garbled, we weren't even sure the language on it was Albanian. But I had not ascended the mountain crags those wee hours. The story of China's departure might have been on Gunny's tape. Information from it would have been sent to London, then the State Department, then to the National Security Council, then to the president, Jimmy Carter, a Navy engineer who might have said, lost their power plants? We'll build them new ones. But they'll have to come over to our side. It was irrelevant now. I had not given my best. In a public park, workers wheeled pianos onto the three performance stages. They set up microphones, tapped wind covers, tested the acoustics. Stan Getz sat on a nearby bench, cradling his saxophone. I wished he would play me a solo. Thank you so much, Robert. Our next reader is Lee Savage. He's a retired third generation soldier who served in the US Air Force from 67 to 71 during the Vietnam era. Then the New York State Air National Guard from 82 to 2005. Lee will be reading a piece entitled Aim High. During the Vietnam era, the Aero Club flight instructor at Westover Air Force Base, Massachusetts turned the Cessna engine off mid-flight. I learned in the event of engine failure to spiral downward, pick up speed, then pull out of the spiral and glide to a landing. I was pumped and confident I could tolerate the G-forces required to become an Air Force pilot. Raised in an Air Force family, I had seen, touched, and sat in the cockpit of numerous aircraft Dad had shown me in various base hangars throughout the United States. I was proud of my father, veteran of foreign wars, proud of my mother, base exchange department manager, and proud to call myself an Air Force brat. After graduation from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, I enlisted in the US Air Force at Westover Air Force Base rather than be drafted. My induction ceremony took place on July 4th, 1967. At the airport before my flight to Lackland Air Force Base, Texas, dad shared this advice. Now remember son, the training only lasts a couple months and then it's over. You never have to do it again and the rest of your career will be much different. They'll replace your civilian clothes with uniforms that all look alike. They'll shave your hair. They do that partly for good hygiene reasons. Some of those farm boys show up with head lice. Some of the instructors will curse in your face and shout derogatory remarks. They'll try to break you down before they build you up. Just realize their words can't hurt you. There's a long range purpose for what they do. They wanna put everyone on an equal starting point. So future advancement is based on merit, not wealth, status or good looks. Thousands of other young men have been through it without injury, so keep your cool. Do whatever they ask, don't argue, and you'll be fine. 
I took dad's advice to heart. Transitioning to training immediately turned disappointing though. The ophthalmologist at San Antonio said, my left eye was too farsighted to be an Air Force pilot. No rocket jockey duty for me. I was crushed, but accepted I could contribute in other ways. So after training, my assignment was base operations at Suffolk County Air Force Base, East Quag, New York. An alert base ready to launch armed fighters at a moment's notice. I was the communications hub between pilots, FAA, the tower, emergency response teams, maintenance, and the command structure. One day, secret service agents were swarming around base operations. I sent military police with lights flashing and sirens blaring to chase the seagulls off the runway because a VIP flight was inbound. I later watched President Nixon's daughter pass through an impressive line of saluting dignitaries. Then I laughed when she hopped into a rusty old Pontiac with a sagging rear bumper driven by what looked like a teenage boy who whisked her away in a puff of blue smoke. Since my military pay was only $300 a month, I moonlighted waiting tables at the officers club and smiled at their childish pranks like tossing bread balls at each other. I also worked construction labor jobs on weekends. Because the Air Force was shorthanded, I eventually had to work at base operations 12 hour shifts, seven days a week near the end of my enlistment. This is not what I thought I would be doing in the Air Force. So I was not unhappy to get out when my initial tour was complete. My transition to civilian life was relatively easy at first especially since my pay tripled. My first civilian job was supervising construction of Hess gasoline stations from Rochester, New York to Greenville, South Carolina. This job lasted only three years as the energy crisis of the 1970s halted construction of gasoline stations. Hired by Carrier Corporation, Syracuse, New York. I worked as an engineer for 13 years and also earned an MBA degree from Syracuse University. When I saw a video in the carrier employee cafeteria of Air Force pilots being interviewed about Pratt & Whitney jet engines, I realized how much I missed Air Force life. I decided to try New York State Air National Guard. It felt good to be in uniform. My morale was high. I felt good defending America's freedoms and values. In the Guard, my assignments and deployments included counter illegal drug missions, NATO operations, joint service intelligence, and NORAD operations. I served in the Northeast Air Defense Sector, Rome, New York, during the September 11th attacks and the conflicts of Afghanistan and Iraq. I retired from the Air National Guard in 2005 with 27 total years of military service but not without some wear and tear along the way. I transitioned to SRC Tech, North Syracuse, New York, manufacturing electronic jammers to defeat remote controlled detonated roadside bombs. The Army called them Duke systems and reported that death by remote control detonation declined by 96%. I got the Corporate Star Award for helping SRC complete the five year contract in two years. I finally retired in 2011 with a lifetime of memories and stories. Although I had not become an Air Force pilot, I had participated in numerous missions and enjoyed the camaraderie of serving with remarkable men and women. Joining the Air National Guard was one of the best decisions I made in my life in terms of achieving a sense of self-worth. I appreciated also the Veterans Administration for its benefits and healthcare programs. Like my father, I have always strived to embody the Air Force motto, aim high. Thank you so much, Lee. Our next reader is Robert Markison. He was drafted just in time for the Tet Offensive. He arrived in February 1968 in Vietnam and slogged the Mekong Delta with the 360th Infantry Battalion, 9th Division, part of the Mobile Riverine Force. Bob resides near Lake Ontario and writes full time. 
He will be reading a piece entitled M16 and Me. On the first day of advanced infantry training, my platoon sat in bleachers, watching the training NCO approach two steel barrels, one set atop the other. A 30 gallon barrel of water weighs about the same as a heavy man. The sergeant lowered his M16 and fired two quick rounds into the top barrel. This was my introduction to the M16. You might imagine the barrel fell over in the direction of the bullets. That would happen on TV. Instead, the spurting barrel lifted straight up before falling back down. Sarge discussed muzzle velocity and bullets designed to tumble, change after hitting a torso, maybe exit an arm or leg. Arm, arm ah, mixed with truth, maybe, but the bullet and rifle were designed to kill. One design spec was to pierce a soldier's steel helmet at 500 meters, both sides at 300 meters, and arrive at the helmet faster than sound. If the round doesn't kill outright, that's okay too. Badly wounded soldiers do not return to the battlefield. Wounded men tie up medics and doctors and scarce medical supplies. I fired the M16 of Vietnam, Vietnam only for practice. My platoon sergeant assigned me to a grenade launcher the first day. I never saw the worst it could do. I did, however, get shot by one. I won't punish with details of this so-called friendly fire shooting inside the barracks. One fellow went to Leavenworth, the other died in the field a week later. As for me, I wasn't even in the same room, but upstairs on my bunk reading a book. Movies and TV would have got this wrong too. Ketchup red blood splashes on today's movie set walls are not accurate. True color must be a mix of whatever the high velocity bullet disturbed. In my case, ribs, spleen, intestine, colon, a wall of many colors. I survived because when I was laid on the table and the surgeon asked, when did this happen? The litter bearer answered 30 minutes ago. And because when the opportunity, opportunity I rushed in to lose consciousness and die, I refused. And of course, luck. They released me from San Francisco's Letterman General four months later with 30 days convalescent leave and orders for Fort Carson. I left the army as soon as they would let me in 1969. I was still living in Colorado Springs at War's End, 1975. In 76, the movie's Taxi Driver and Missouri Breaks came out. I'd never before seen so much blood in movies. Great, I thought. Movies seem to be getting it right. I didn't like the blood then, and I don't like it now, but I had this naive notion back in my 20s that if people would actually see what war looked like, they would not be so eager. About the same time, I first saw Policeman's M16 on TV news. What the hell, I thought, what is this doing on American streets? Don't they know what it does, that firefights might be random? Collateral damage is our euphemism for killing bystanders. This is how I thought about assault weapons back in the day when actual conversations might occur whether police need carry guns at all. English bobbies apparently didn't, did not, but that was then. My title is M16 and me, but my inspiration is the Parkland, Florida high school shooting, 17 dead, 17 wounded. That AR-15 was the same I trained with at Fort Polk. Not knowing the difference between an AR-15 and M16, I asked an ex-Mekong Delta platoon sergeant, who even spent a few hours as a Viet Cong captive. He said the AR-15 had a three-pronged flash suppressor that could snag the binding wire on a case of C-rations and twist quickly, snap it. I remembered rifles used that way when C's were delivered by helicopter. AR-15, M16, today's M4 are all essentially the same. Modify the chrome, modify and chrome the receiver here, shorten the barrel there, redesign, redesign the flash suppressor, and you can change the name. They all fire the same cartridge and bullet. At the Fort Lauderdale Airport 2017, 
a nine millimeter handgun produced 11 victims. A Florida radiologist writing in the Atlantic Magazine diagnosed six survivors. Their handgun wounds were typical of wounds she diagnosed every day. Bullet tracks through the liver, say, were x-rayed as thin gray lines about the same size as the bullet. After treatment, all survived. The same radiologist was on duty during the high school shooting. These were, wounds were different. She described one x-rayed organ as an overripe melon smashed with a sledgehammer, bleeding extensively. A surgeon at the same hospital opened a student and found shreds of an organ, he said, nothing to repair or fix. A still living high school student with a fatal wound. Piercing a steel helmet at 500 meters requires a muzzle velocity of 3000 feet per second, nearly three times the velocity of the civilian Glock handgun carried by police. Velocity corresponds to damage. The Glock's lower velocity is that thin gray line. The AR-15 is the smashed melon. The radiologist writes, the high velocity bullet causes a swath of tissue damage that extends several inches from its path and does not have to actually hit an artery to cause catastrophic bleeding. An AR-15 bullet to the middle of the liver would cause so much bleeding, the patient would likely never make it to the trauma center. People today want concealed carry police in our schools. A concealed weapon is a short barreled handgun, practically the definition of low velocity and poor accuracy. I think it's one very brave or foolhardy safety resource officer with a Glock who goes up against an angry teenager's AR-15. It's nearly a half century now since I first saw that policeman with his M16 on TV news and we still do not seem to grasp what these weapons do. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Our final reader tonight is Richard Rodriguez. Richard is a disabled veteran and a single parent of four. He holds a bachelor's degree in fine arts from the University of Texas at Arlington, and he's received local and national awards for his writing, most notably uh, first place award in the National Veterans Arts Competition for his poem, Homeless Masses, and second in the same competition just this last, just this year for his poem, Just Say No. Tonight he will be reading his poem, Appalled. Richard? Richard, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Know my loss of my adopted country that I fought so hard to be a part. Should not, do not my medals, my sacrifices, all my suffered pain have to leave <laughs> citizen pain. Does not my squandered youth in the embattled jungles, deserts, or idle posts make me a part of the host? Was this not a covenant, a promise that a goal of my fidelity, my honor, my loyalties and sacrifice can obtain. Does not my alcoholic, drugged, abused, mentally unstable, PTSD fueled transgressions brought upon by my service to my adopted country be entitled to both forgiveness and treatment? Instead, because of these, these transgressions, I am dragged out of my home, pre-dawn early light, and separated from both family and friends, and cast back to a country of my birth. That, and only that, being my only connection to that country. Now, isn't it ironic that the only way that I can be trend, I can be repatriated and become a permanent citizen of my adopted country is through the ultimate sacrifice that I was so willing to perform those many years ago to help ensure the freedoms of others greater and lesser than me. Yes. 
My only way home is in a box. Shrouded in darkness, draped by the stars that do not run. And to be lowered into the soil of my adopted land. To the sound of taps as the folded flag is presented to my kin. Thank you, Richard. So we are going to now open up the chat space for questions, comments. Ivy has been, and Diane have been watching the chat and I know there are some questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ivy and Diane to moderate those questions. Feel free to write any responses or further questions that you have for us. We will relay them to the panelists our readers, and thank you for listening. I know some of you may have to drop off at this point, but we appreciate you listening. We also recorded this, so if you would like to have a copy of it, drop that in the chat and we'll make sure we get it to you. Thank you to the readers, wonderful job. Thank you, Eileen, and thank you to all of the readers. Um, it's so wonderful to hear all of your stories. We do have a few questions and I'll just um, start with the first one that came in from Diane Weiner. Um, and this is an open question to anyone who'd like to answer. Um, what are your favorite poems and prose, yours and or others about service and justice? And please unmute yourselves, Veterans Writing Group members, so that you can respond. Well, my favorite uh, book about Vietnam is uh, The Thing They Carried. Um, and the favorite poem is a World War I poem uh, called In Flanders Fields. And both of those uh, say, say it in different ways, uh, but they, they capture the experience. I have, uh, actually, it's a favorite uh, uh, piece uh, authored by uh, Tobias Wolf, who was, used to be uh, a professor at Syracuse University. And um, he, he was a Green Beret in his early life. And, um, and he spent a year in Vietnam. Uh, as a translator. The book that he wrote is called In Pharaoh's Army. And it speaks to me about the, the idiocy of war um, and how it um, has lasting effects on combatants. And, you know, obviously, um, and people who live in the host country. Anyone else want to respond to the Diane's question? Yeah, Jen. I I also like Tobias Wolf's writing, and I wrote a poem off of a chapter there called "The Dog Is in the Soup," um, <laughs> and. Uh, I think he, he was a very powerful writer. Um, and then I also like the Iliad because it shows that, you know, more things change the more they stay the same and that we've been struggling with, you know, how to come home from war for many, 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 many years. Anyone else? Richard, you'll have to unmute. I'm on mute, right? Okay. Yeah, you're on mute. Uh, I guess um, if you're talking about what influence, what influenced me into going into the military was, uh, it was more, it was paper lace, really don't be a hero, the song. Um, if you get a chance, go ahead and, and download and listen to it. I mean, that was a big influence. Um, I, I like, I, I mean, I like to say it was some classical reading or something like that, but it was, 
it was modern media. It was, I don't know. It was, um, I, I fell in love with MASH. I always, I was interested in the, not the heroes, but the, the people who were behind the heroes. I, I was, I was so interested in that for every hero, there was like a thousand people that made him that hero. And they were the they were the ones that you never heard of. And it just I loved I loved that fact. I loved the fact that I was always comfortable in being not being up front, but leading. And I think that was a that was a unique thing. I don't know if I'm making sense or not, but um, that was that was my influence. My influence was, it was modern, it was modern uh, media. It was modern, modern songs, modern stories, no, no classics in there. Thanks, Richard. I wanted to just throw out one title that um, I have found really powerful. Um, Jess Goodell's um, Shade at Black, which is she's a Marine who served um, in Iraq and she was in mortuary fairs, which a lot of people don't know much about, but she cares for the, the war dead and um, processes the bodies to have them sent back to Dover to the families. So that uh, book I think is really powerful. It's nonfiction and it really speaks from the experience of, of ultimate loss. So I would recommend that to anyone who's interested in these stories. It's tough to read. It may be a trigger for people, but I think for civilians, which I want to emphasize not knowing much about this issue, I think it's a really important read. Um, I want to make sure we can go on to other questions. Did uh, Robert, did you want to say something? You're going to have to yes. unmute. Yeah, go ahead. I, I want to talk about this group and a, a war poem. We had a prompt about uh, thank you for your service. I remember that was a prompt in this group once. And we had some very terrific responses. And it, and it caused me to think about my own uh, experience with thank you for your service. And, and what came out was a poem, which is just now published in Proud to Be. And uh, the, the format of it is, is called recitative, uh, which comes from opera. It's an argument between two sides. On the one side, my son's saying, you know, you, your, your military service was garbage. You had it easy. And, and the veteran on the other side is saying, but I'm on an aircraft carrier. I could get fucking killed any moment. Pardon my French, you know. I mean, there's gasoline around here. Somebody could smoke. And then the kids come in and they say, hey, you had it easy. You're not in a war zone. And then the guy's the better. So he's in, a, in an argument with him and his sons, you know. And, and anyway, it just um, it convinced me how valuable these workshop sessions are and how they get you to think and write your own response. You write your own response, and that's what it comes down to. So I'm going to go back to Ivy. Um, thank you. And if people have any any of our vets in our group or anyone attending who has specific responses about literary works or poetry, that Diane's question about that, feel free to type that in the chat. Maybe there's people in the audience who have some thoughts about that. So I want to add, go back to Ivy and see if she wants to bring another question forward. Okay, yeah, we actually have several questions. So I'm going to direct this one specifically to Pete. Um, Pete, this is from Nick Rader. He says, my work focuses on veterans who struggle with literacy. My father, for example, is a combat Vietnam veteran who struggled with dyslexia before suffering injuries in the war that inhibit his literacy. His PTSD is particularly severe. My question is, what brief advice might you give to veterans who want to begin writing about their experiences but struggle with writing? Oh, you have to unmute, Pete. <laughs> I would invite him 
to come to one of our meetings. Um, and the reason I say that is that uh, there, there's a wide range of um, people who, who belong to our group um, in terms of writing skill. And um, what I've found is that, is that you'll get help from the folks who sit in our circles every month that, that, that we meet in terms of, of not only dealing with, um, you know, how to, how to um, you know, put his thoughts into, into writing, but to also explore the sorts of things that that he really wants to talk about, but doesn't know how to communicate it. I wanted to also throw out a thought, a thought about that and maybe others in the room or in the audience, but um, we have had members come to our writing group who don't want to write. They just want to talk or tell stories. And we have had some members who've, who've really gone from just telling stories and you know, maybe writing a one word or a couple words on a pad to now being writers and being motivated by others. But there's a place for oral storytelling and interviews with vets and the kind of story core model, um, I think is important. So I just want to say to Nick, who by the way, uh, is a writer himself um, and a veteran, um, that it's possible uh, to have an exchange. So with you, this being your father, maybe one way into it is not only to encourage the writing, but, but to just see if he'd be willing to be recorded or have you write down the stories. Um, because we certainly have had people who haven't written much in our group and they're more about the connection and the community and the oral storytelling. And um, I also run a writing group at a senior living community where I've worked with a lot of World War II vets and a lot of them won't write any, they won't put anything on paper because of this being, you know, silent about their war experiences, but uh, the communal aspect of the group will get them storytelling. And so somebody in the group will write their stories down. So I just wanted to throw that out in addition to what Pete said. Okay, so we have another, oh, Lee had a, a hand up. Yeah, so I just wanna say that um, like myself, um, I was invited to just sit in and not have to write. I decided you know, after two or three meetings to start writing and putting my uh, stories down. So if, if, uh, if he wants to join our group, he doesn't have to say anything. He can just listen. And um, he doesn't have to write anything unless he gets ready and feels he's ready to do that. So don't, don't make him feel like he's, you know, he's got to join us only if he's got something to write about. Thank you, Nick, for that question. Um, we have a question from Patrick Berry, the chair of our writing department. Thank you for being here, Patrick. Um, so Patrick says, thank you so much for these powerful, evocative and honest pieces. As I listened to them, I was struck by the way each writer conveyed the passage of time, chronicling the changes both in the world and in their own lives. I'm thinking here of Pete's memory of Syracuse then and now, and Jennifer's development as a writer with the amazing Minnie Bruce Pratt, who urged her to carefully interrogate the narratives that were circulating about women, children, and liberation. And the question is, I wonder if any of the writers has any thoughts they'd like to share on how they deal with the passage of time and perhaps memory in their writing. And I'm also thinking of what Minnie Bruce would call memory work, which is like that hard work of kind of telling your brain to remember. She used to say, you just tell your brain to remember whatever the thing is and then go for a walk and come back and your brain will do the work. <laughs> so Richard, and you have to unmute. It's funny that you, you mentioned memory. I had for the longest problems I had um, as far as doing memoir writing or something like that. Um, 
I had I had a problem of uh, writing things that didn't actually happen that way. <laughs> you know, you seem to, I, I think it happens with all of us, we, we seem to skew things. Um, I had some bad, I had some very bad things happen and, and I put it into, when I, when I write some of it down or I try to, it doesn't come out the way um, it, it happened. And I found that out from a third person, from their memories or, or from actu reading actual reports or something. And I said, I don't remember it that way, but I guess that's the way I, it, when I write it down, it helps me heal by coloring it or, or not putting it as, as harsh as it actually happens. So I had, I had a, I have a tendency some, sometimes to, uh, um, to uh, um, make it more whimsical purposely. So that's why I know that it's not 100% exactly there, but it's not 100% for a reason, probably for my own protection. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> um, Bill Cross. And you need to unmute. Yeah, you know, you, you talked about that, Richard, about, you know, the, the how memory changes. And in my experience working with folks, um, memory changes as we can become more open to the experience. And more stuff comes in as we go along that we have forgotten. Um, because it, it, you know, this is scary stuff that's happened to us and traumatic stuff that's happened to us. And, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which our brains protect us. And one of them is not to remember it all clearly, but as we sit and write, um, these things emerge. I, I think of it like, uh, swamp gas, you know, like when the conditions are right, the swamp gas will come up and pop. And a memory, when the conditions are right, when we're feeling safe, when we're feeling able to handle it, the memory comes back in, in ways that we hadn't experienced it before. And I think part of what happens and the, the beauty of, of writing and particularly in our group, but, but writing in general, um, is that it, it, it helps us learn all the different ways in which our experience is held within us. And there's all sorts of stuff that goes on in there. You know, there's pain and there's joy and, and, and there's, there's sadness and there's, there's fear and there's curiosity and wonder and awful terror. And all those things are within us. And to me, what, what the writing does, it helps us connect with all those different parts of us. And like, uh, you know, Dylan's got a new, new movie out, a new uh, album out. One of the cuts on it is called, I Contain Multitudes. And, you know, we contain multitudes of our experience. And I think part of what this process does is help us embrace all of that and helps us heal. Thank you. I have a comment. Um, it, took, it took me years to sort through my memory um, and what I learned is, is that the subconscious mind is, is a wondrous thing. It, it protects us from, from harmful memories. And you have to give yourself time uh, for the subconscious to, 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 to unlock the secrets to these you know, memories. They're there. Um, and, and the way that I did it, um, the memoir that I, that I um, just published took me 
12 years of, of serious research work just to, just to ground myself um, and to try to, I, I read after action reports um, on my team's actions. I, I, I read books written by folks who, who, who were in special forces and it allowed me to put a frame, you know, create a framework within which I could fill in the details. The details were pretty sparse in the beginning, but, but the further I dug, the more details surfaced and it, it was just amazing. And, and you, you can't rush that. Um, it, it happens. You just have to be patient. And connected to, to that, I, I'd like to jump in. I, I know that there were a couple other hands, but I'm gonna to toss another question out that's related and we can continue with the responses. I know Jen had a hand up. Um, we have another question from John Perrick asking, how often do you revisit your pieces and are suddenly reminded of certain aspects of your experience that you had previously forgotten? So just building on this question about memory and I'll, I'll go to Jen. Yeah. Um, I think I kind of off of what Pete was saying is when I do that memory work, I don't have a, like a detailed memory. Um, so I have to write a lot of stuff around what, what happened in order to get to the core of what I'm trying to remember or talk about. And again, it's like using your subconscious and using, um, letting your mind think it's safe to write all that out and then then kind of really start looking at where the kernel of what I what I'm trying to say is like the piece that I wrote for this um started out in a really different direction different tangent that had no real point <laughs> for for what, what I was trying to say um but the the feelings and what what I was trying to say was so um, had a lot of grief in it. So I was writing something else. So just to remind yourself to keep writing. And, and I would say too, like to Nick, that I don't think there's any harm in um, doing oral storytelling as far as like really getting your stories out. My, my father is also has dyslexia and he's not really a writer, but he's a, he's a very good orator. And um, he tells a lot of stories and every once in a while, he'll come up with one I've never heard before from his time when he was in the army in the sixties. And it's, it's, they're all really interesting stories. And a lot of times people just need someone to listen to them, so. Robert, were you also going to? Um... Yeah, I just want to pick up on what Jennifer just said that the people need somebody to listen to them. Um, when I lived in Alabama, I, somebody knocked on my door at like 10, 10 p.m. And it was a veteran. And he had heard from the, the apartment office that I was a veteran, so he knocked on my door. And that it's something that veterans can tell. I could tell right away that this person needed an audience. And he said, are you a vet? And can I tell you what happened to me? And that's like a, a red flag. I just said, yeah, yeah, sure, come on in. And uh, he came back like two or three times. And uh, I, on his fourth trip, I asked him, can I take notes? He said, yeah, sure. You know, uh, and his story just about his involvement in Iraq just kept coming out. And I noticed that there were figures that started to come to life you know, characters that he knew just started to come to life on, a, on my pages as I was taking my notes. So I, I kept doing it and writing it up. Uh, War Literature and the Arts is gonna publish that piece next fall. But he needed somebody to give him a platform. He needed a platform and, and being a vet, I understood that intuitively, so I, uh, he wasn't a writer, but he was happy that somebody was going to write up his account. 
We have one more question. Um, do we have time, Eileen, for one more question? Okay, we have one more question, and this may have to be the last one from Emily Pfeiffer. Um, and this is directed um, in response to Bill Cross's piece. Um, Bill Cross's line that went something like, I am still 50 years later in the process of returning from the war struck me so deeply. I am curious about the role of writing in this process for readers tonight, for the readers tonight. How does writing impact or become part of this process, um, the process of returning from war? Um, how does writing impact or become part of this process of returning from war? No worries if there is no time. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I read more than I needed to. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the question for me is that it, um, more stuff just keeps coming, you know? I, Mm -hmm. There's no end to this, um, and and writing is part of how, how that gets expressed, and and listening to what other people have written, uh, you know, it triggers stuff that I'd forgotten, <laughs> and um, you know, it it's ongoing. You know, I, I really think the healing takes place by people being able to, to express themselves in a safe environment. And it's, it takes, it doesn't, it doesn't remove the pain, but it tempers it. It, don't, it, it, it helps you own it and not be so damn afraid of it. The way I think, you know, a lot of these things happen. And yet when we're, we're able to, to hear other people saying things and have people listen to us. It's a beautiful way of being able to explore and embrace all of it and to take the edge off the stuff that we feel controlled by. And I, I think one of the things too is it helps you understand that this is a uh, something it's an integral part of your life it's not something you have to put over here it's all a part of you and it's all still forming and I think there's a tendency to be like I'm going to fix myself um, I'm going to heal and fix myself well it's part of you it's part of who you are and there's nothing wrong with that I think that's what I learned by being in community with other veteran writers you, you learn to live with the things that you've experienced. Um, they, they no longer pose um, a threat. You, you've, you've explored it. You've gotten comfortable with it. You've written about it. You've tossed it around, you know, and then you set it to the side and you deal with the next one. And it just, you know, that's the way it works. And and the more that you th think about this and, <clears throat> and commit it to paper, the easier it is to move, to, to leave that memory behind and just, you know, in a little book or a tablet and you work on another one. Um, and you always have something to look back on to refresh your memory if you're thinking about you know, a particular aspect of that memory that you hadn't considered before. I wanted to add too that as one of the co-leaders of the group that I often get contacted by veterans that don't even live in New York state or that live far away from Syracuse and saying, uh, I, I wanna tell you my story or will you find a way to publish my story? And sometimes I'm able to help people do that, but uh, one of the most um, important contacts I had was with a World War II veteran who was in his 90s, and he just passed away recently, and he contacted our group, and he sent us his story, which some of us read and responded to, and then we did publish his story on our website. Uh, his name is Jack Brink. He was in, he was 19 when he went in the military and went overseas to the European theater, and what was striking to me was 
he, it was so important for him to have that story published before he died. And I corresponded with his family. I'd never met any of these people. Um, his kids told me, his grown up kids told me how important it was that he published his story, that it was on the web and that people would see it. Um, and he was silent about it for many years. So I, I just wanna say one of the things he said to me that I'll never forget is that when he goes to sleep at night, the sounds and smells of war return to him as if he's there. And he went, he was in World War II when he was 19 and 20 years old. And when he was writing those lines, he was in his nineties. So I wanna underscore what Bill said about things keep coming up or things don't go away. And I do think writing is one way to name and uh, find a way to engage the experiences, to share them with others and not be so burdened. One of the things that always happens after these readings is someone will often come up and say, my dad or my you know, family members, a military veteran, they never talk about what they did. I don't even know what they did. So I think that for civilians in the audience, like being able to have a conversation with your loved ones who are in the military, like maybe opening space, maybe that story is pretty locked up in there for a lot of different reasons. Maybe it comes out at the the VFW over a beer or whatever, but there's a way in which I think civilians have a responsibility to help be conduits for these stories if veterans aren't finding communities or spaces where they can share those stories, like for us to step up and provide the space for that to happen or try our best to have a conversation or a dialogue. And that's really what this writing group is about. Um, Ivy, Diane and I are civilians. Um, I started this group because I felt like I, I felt an obligation that we needed to create spaces for veterans to write their stories and to share them if publicly or with their families at the very least. So I just will say that return from war is everyone's return from war. It's our return from war. We sent veterans to war in our, or sent military personnel to war in our name. So it's our responsibilities to, to bring people back to participate in reintegration, to value those stories, to listen to the difficult stories, to know that people went to war in our name or went into the military in a lot of ways for us, even if it was for them as well. So I, I wanna add that because I just feel like that's something that doesn't get talked about enough is the responsibilities that we really have as civilians to making sure these stories are heard and listening to those stories, which is really what tonight was about. I'd just like to say um, a strong written rant can also be a stress reliever. <laughs> and we don't have Ralph Wilsey in the room tonight, but he, right. he's yeah. famous in our writing group for writing rants. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I, do, I do wanna, while we're still, while we still have everyone gathered, I do wanna acknowledge though that several members of our group are in the audience tonight lending their support. Um, and we're so glad to, you know, have you here with us. Um, we have Andrew and Don and Dawson. Um, Deal is here. Um, so thank you, everybody, for being here. And Linda, too. And I hope I didn't miss anyone. So um, as we wrap up tonight, I want to thank the audience and thank our readers. And we're, you can imagine everybody clapping very loudly for all of you and whooping because <laughs> we often have people uncontrollably whooping at our readings, maybe weeping too. Um, but I want to mention that Dr. Bill Cross on November 20th will be doing a webinar about his experiences um, with uh, trauma resilience and working as a psychotherapist with trauma resilience. He'll also be telling a little bit more of his story coming home from Vietnam, his experiences. So on November 20th from 12 to 1.30 as part of the Finding True North stories, um, we will have Dr. Cross sharing his experiences. And so I'll make sure that everybody who registered for this has that information if you'd like to come back and listen more to Bill's story and also learn more about his work with trauma resilience. He's helped a lot of veterans and their families with that question of trauma resilience. And he's also helped the larger Syracuse community, police officers, first responders with trauma resilience. 
So unless we have other questions, Ivy or Diane, I know Diane is also in the room and she is our meditation leader. And I just want to introduce her as our meditation leader. She leads us in meditation before our writing group session. So if anybody would like to come and join us for that, um, the half an hour before our meeting start, we're meeting on Zoom because of the pandemic. Diane leads us in meditation. Lee, final word. Yes, did you mention our uh, a book called The Weight of My Armor? Yes, I did. Oh, I mentioned okay. it earlier. Thank you, though. It's never, it's always good to fan the flames of interest. <laughs> I think at this point, we're going to thank our audience. Ivy, is there anything else coming out of the chat that you want to convey? Um, no, looks good. Um, we, well, I guess I should say that many people have expressed glowing thanks and appreciation for the reading and we will have a transcript of the chat that will print out after the session so we can share that with all of our readers but thank you everyone so much um, for all of your comments everyone who came um, and we just so appreciate being able to share our stories with you thanks everyone and have a good evening and thank you for honoring veterans by listening to their stories and thanks so much to the Syracuse Veterans Writing Group Good night, everyone. Good night.